Revelation chapter 16 and verse 15. Revelation chapter 16 and verse 15 says, Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. Behold, I come as a thief. Our message this Sabbath is entitled, The Now of Prophecy. The Now of Prophecy. It's part of a bigger series I have called Anchored in Time, but for today, it's The Now of Prophecy. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this opportunity to study your word. We thank you, Lord, for your truth, and we thank you, Lord, for your mercy and your grace. I ask now, Lord, in a special way, once again, that you just make me a nail on the wall. And upon that nail, Lord, I ask that you hang a portrait of Jesus Christ. Let me not be seen or heard. Instead, Father, let us hear a word from the throne room of grace. It's our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we're going to go to the book of 2 Peter, and we're going to be focused on history and prophecy in this session, history and prophecy. And remember, the title of our session is The Prophecy of Now. 2 Peter 1 and verse 19 says, We have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto you do well that take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place, until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. Peter is writing this after he just reflected in the first part of the chapter on the Mount of Transfiguration, the time when he, when Peter, James, and John went up and met with Christ and met Moses and, uh, and Elijah, who were uh, visiting from heaven. You can go back and read the, the story in the Gospels. <clears throat> but after Peter gives the beautiful verses on what happened there, in 2 Peter chapter 1, he moves on in verse 19 to say, even more sure than what he saw on the Mount of Transfiguration, even more sure than the miracles he saw Jesus work, he says there is a more sure word of prophecy. Why is that important? Because for us, we have not been eyewitnesses to the miracles of Christ. We don't get to see the transfiguration, but we have prophecy. I was in a, we were, we were doing a, um, a, a discussion with some gentlemen um, of the Muslim faith, very distinguished gentlemen, very kind, very polite um, Muslims, and we were doing a discussion uh, with them, um, orchestrated um, about the prophecies of the Bible compared to the prophecies of Muhammad. And this is one of the verses that I showed, that I, that I, that I read, to show that as Christians, prophecy is critical. And so if I had time on the subject of prophecy and history, I would go to Daniel chapter 2, Daniel chapter 7, um, Revelation chapter 12. There's so many chapters in the Bible I could go to, never mind looking at certain things from Isaiah and Jeremiah and others that really show the power of prophecy, especially in a historical context. I don't have time to do that tonight. We're going to go somewhere else with it. But um, I can anchor my faith, and that's why the series is Anchored in Time. I can anchor my faith in the fact that I'm not just believing uh, hearsay or stories. The scriptural prophecies, and when we look at the Dead Sea Scrolls, um, and, and, the, and the veracity of the writings of the Bible. And there's a lot we could get into. And this weekend, I'm also doing some talks on apologetics for Christians and Adventists. But when we get deep into the archaeology and the history of what we believe, we're not just believing something that's made up, some, some fairy tale out of the sky. There is something we can anchor our faith in if we're willing to study and pray for the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Peter goes on to say in 1 Peter 1, 2 Peter 1, sorry, in verse 20, knowing this first, that no prophecy of, of the scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, get this, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. We got the Bible as men spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. So the Bible is not one book written by one person that is an exact translation today of what it was then because the bible is not word inspired it is thought inspired the, the bible is written so that we can extract the thought from the passage 
and the Holy Spirit that breathed that thought into the writer, whether it was Moses or whether it was Ezekiel or whether it was Matthew, the Holy Spirit that breathed that thought into that individual can now elucidate and enlighten our minds with that very same thought. So folk attack the Bible, they say, oh, it's been changed, it's been this, it's been that. The question you always ask yourself is, when you study the Bible under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, are you extracting from it the thought that was breathed, that moved on these men of God as they wrote? Is what the Holy Ghost put on them, are you able to get it back out? This is why when you read scripture many times, sometimes you see things new and you get new things. It's because there's so much that happens when the Holy Spirit moves. So for our discussion today, we're going to jump to the book of Matthew, chapter 24, and I'm going to read the first two verses, and then we're going to go through these some prophecies. Um, I've been doing these talks on Matthew 24 since the pandemic began, but I'm going to add some more color and detail to this um, talk. Matthew 24, 1 and 2 says, And Jesus went out and departed from the temple. And his disciples came to him for the sh to show him the buildings of the temple. The reason the disciples wanted to show him the buildings of the temple is because Jesus had just said in Matthew chapter 23, I leave your house unto you desolate. He turned over the tables of the money changers and he, so he walked in and said, I leave your house unto you desolate. This scared the disciples because the disciples believed that he was the king, not the, not the Christ Messiah who would come again in the clouds of glory and redeem all mankind, but they thought he was the king that would sit in David's seat and vanquish the Romans. When he said that the, he left the temple desolate, the disciples were perplexed. So they start to show him as they walk out of the temple, the beautiful buildings, the beautiful uh, uh, edifice, the stonework, the, everything about it. But Matthew 24 and verse 2, Jesus said unto them, see ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, there shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. Can you imagine? The disciples shook their heads. They couldn't believe it. They were astonished. The temple's going to be destroyed? But th without the temple, we have no nation. Nehemiah had to rebuild the, the temple, the walls of the temple. Um, as we rebuilt the temple, we, you know, what do you mean it's going to be torn down? And the temple in Jesus' day would have looked something like this. This is one artist's rendition of it. But once they got alone with Jesus, Matthew 24 and verse 3, as, and as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately saying, tell us, when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of thy coming and the end of the world? They get him alone. They say, wait a minute, Lord. <laughs> When is, when is this going to happen? When will the temple be destroyed? And, and when are you going to come in your glory? And when does the world come to an end? The way you're talking, that's what we should be asking. Of course, 40 years later, Jerusalem falls as Titus, uh, the Roman general, uh, sieges the city and eventually troops take the city and destroy the temple just as prophesied by Christ. Um, and the prophecy is so sure that when you look at Daniel 9, 20 to 27, and I don't have time to get into it deep, but um, where it is given that from the decree to rebuild the temple um, would be uh, 70 weeks. 70 weeks ends in AD 34 when Stephen is stoned. And that last week, the scripture says in Daniel chapter 9, says that in the last week, the Messiah should be cut off. Well, in the middle of that week, three and a half years into the middle of that 70th week is when the crucifixion happened. This is why we as Christians don't have to just believe blindly. We know when Ezra made the decree. We know it's in the Bible. We know that, that is, it was written long before the fall of Jerusalem or the coming of Christ. In fact, as we are heading into the first Advent season of what the world calls Christmas, you've got to understand that the reason the wise men knew to go and look for the king being born is because they probably understood the prophecies of Daniel chapter 9. That's how sure these prophecies are. We don't believe cunningly devised fables. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? Matthew 24 and verse 4, And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. 
And I like that word, deceive. In the Greek, it is the word planeo. It's the word that means to lead astray, like the one sheep being led away from the 99. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled. For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. Jesus then goes on to say, for nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places. Then verse eight of Matthew 24 is a frightening text. It says, all these are the beginning of sorrows. Let's go through all these things that will be the beginning of sorrows. Well, first Jesus says, there will be false Christs. So I'll go around here. This is a Puerto Rican American, Jose Luis de Jesus Miranda. I don't believe he's alive still. But he first said he was the Christ, then he said he was the Antichrist. You see, he had the, the, the 666 attached to him. This person had it tattooed on him. This is in Miami, Florida. And Miami is not home to just one false Christ. This is Yahweh ben Yahweh, um, who believed he was uh, the Messiah, reincarnate. I could I won't get into him. Sun, Sun Myung Moon, also in Korea. This is David Koresh, who um, had, had, you know, you'd argue had ties to Adventism, but of course he went far away from what we believe or anything related to our denomination. But he also said that he was the Messiah. So, and this is just a few. I mean, they sang praises to Hitler um, as if he was a God. Um, the Caesars of Rome were worshiped as if they were gods. I mean, the false Christ are mortals who emulate Jesus. So I put these here, but just as Christ prophesied throughout history, people would worship people. Many would claim this, and National Geographic actually put out an um, article in this. This is an African that said he was um, the Messiah, or uh, the Christ, and he, I think he, this is the one who drove taxis by day, a Brazilian, an inherent cult leader who claims to be reincarnation of Jesus, arrested in Russia. This is a different article than these. So you can see that this is a, this, just as Jesus prophesied, it's still happening. It happens in many different ways. Of course, if you listen to music, reggae music, um, there are those who claim that Haley Selassie pictured here is, um, was the, is God. Haley Selassie never claimed it, but to this day, um, many people worship Rastafari or Haley Selassie, um, who they say is God, who was Jesus returned in his kingly character. And they go through texts of scripture to try and make the point. Of course, Haley Selassie has come and gone from Ethiopia and Clearly, nothing, nothing about him being a king still, still exists on earth. But then, of course, you have people like Kanye West and Jay-Z, who um, Kanye started calling himself Jesus, and now it changes the name officially to Ye. Jay-Z says things like, I am Jehovah God MC. So you still have these people who claim to be false gods. Jesus' prophecy still holds true. It says that there would be a, a, a wars and rumors of war. We had a century of war last century. When you look at... Um, what happened in um, Europe specifically, World War I, World War II, then it moved to Asia. We had the communist revolutions, you had the Vietnam War, the Korean War. Um, of course, Africa had its wars. This is just one, the, uh, um, the Congo War, the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Um, there are many others. The Rwandan genocide wasn't war, but all these things are prophesied and they've been fulfilled. And they're unique in the world's history because there was no way to have war on the scale we've had it in the last 120, 140 years. People were shooting arrows and, and spears and, and, you know, and, and maybe cannons, but nuclear bombs, um, supersonic jets, uh, tanks, um, automatic machine guns, these type of weapons didn't exist. Prophetically, war has evolved. And you can look at this in armed conflict since 1945. 84% of the casualties have been civilians. This is a little old data, but you get the gist. An estimated 1.6 million children have been have killed in, in conflict since 1990. And this is, again, as old as that number is much higher. Red Cross estimates that over 100 million people were killed in wars in the 20th century. And in 1993, which is about less than, less than um, 30 years ago, there were 29 major wars were fought in 1993. So, it was a century of war. And of course, there's famine. I won't get into this. This shows you number of hungry between 1999 and 2010 this is old, but you can see that we've had this major problem with hunger that has bubbled to the surface this week where 
the billionaire Elon Musk, which is worth, I think, something like $160 billion, some ridiculous number. Um, Elon Musk tweets he is willing to spend $6 billion to fight world hunger on one condition. So um, there was a tweet, and I'll show you the tweet here. Um, um, 2%, the, this guy from the, um, the World uh, Food Bank, um, Dr. Eli David, I believe it is, who said that 2% of Elon Musk's wealth uh, is uh, $6 billion in 2020. The United Nations Food Pro Program raised $8.4 billion. How come it didn't solve world hunger? They, they asked that question, but they say 2% of Elon Musk's wealth could solve world hunger, says Director of the United Nations Food Scarcity Program. And so Elon Musk has challenged them to um, come up with a plan and show the world where the money goes and all of this kind of stuff. So it's a hot debate. goes back to the prophecy, famine. There will be a lot of people in the world who die because they, have, they don't have what they need. And Elon Musk, of course, is um, uh, from South Africa. Um, pestilence. We're talking about the coronavirus now. I won't get into all the pestilence, but I just read an article in one of my medical journals today that says that the, many doctors are saying that if this coronavirus, if we can get through it, which it seems to just keep resurging, um, the next iteration, the next pandemic is right behind it. We'll have to wait and see. Of course, earthquakes in diverse places. This is the national, uh, America's National Geologic Survey. And you can see that the number of deadly and destructive earthquakes between six and eight magnitude, look at the increase, just as prophesied. Something's going on. This earthquake trend magnitude six plus old quake over, the, over a 10 year average. This is up to 2014. And you can see the increases in significant earthquakes there as well. Is this just a coincidence, a trend? Well, we can look at it. This is the, this is the destruction from earthquake in Japan um, uh, several years ago. This is New Zealand, Chile. Remember, earthquakes in diverse places. In Haiti, and Haiti has been hit with earthquakes um, pretty bad. There was a tsunami in the Indian Ocean earlier this century um, from an earthquake that killed, uh, I think, over a quarter of a million people. Um, but it's not just earthquakes. It's storms, and you're going to see, I don't talk about it here, but there's a push because of climate change or perceived climate change. Some people don't believe in it, but climate change um, you can see annual frequency of North Atlantic tropical storms has shot up. And they're saying that the storms are stronger. So these prophecies of Matthew chapter 24 it goes into fires. The Siberia, they had a wildfire that was now, that's now bigger than at the time when this was written. The summer is now bigger than all the fires in the world combined. So we started seeing massive fires. The Greek islands had fires. Um, Devastating wildfires of 2021 are, are, are breaking records and satellites are tracking. Climate change, July was the world's hottest month ever recorded, the US agency says. And this is gonna drive some of the other prophecies that we won't have a chance to talk about in this session, but how do you combat that? There are a lot of people saying, listen, we need to give the world a rest. And we believe in that. I mean, listen, I, we recycle everything in our house. We make sure we, you know, I'm, I'm looking to get an electric car because I want to, Scripture says God is going to destroy those who destroy the earth. So I want to do to be the best steward of the earth I can be. But the solutions will get to the point where some of them, somebody's going to say, listen, we need to rest one day a week. What day a week do you think that's going to be? And that's coming. But rising floods, this is in China. Um, you can see that the flood waters rose, even in Europe. And this is, I think, in Germany, massive floods this summer that really were nothing like anything we've ever seen before. So the prophecies, Matthew chapter 24 and verse 7, these prophecies are being fulfilled. So two-thirds of all children in the world born in a nation that cannot feed them. 57 million people die each year because of famine. 60% of the people in the world are malnourished and 20% are starving. Um, and there's tons of other stuff that we could say here. Here's what the spirit of prophecy says. I've read this in other messages. She says, Satan works through the elements also to garner his harvest of unprepared souls. He has studied the secrets of the laboratories of nature, and he uses all his power to control the elements as far as God allows. While appearing to the children of men as a great physician who can heal all their maladies, he will bring disaster and disaster until populous cities are reduced to ruin and desolation. Even now he is at work. In accidents and calamities by sea and by land, in, gate, in great conflagrations, in fierce tornadoes and terrific hailstorms, in tempests, floods, cyclones, tidal waves, 
and earthquakes and every place and in a thousand forms, Satan is exercising his power. He sweeps away the ripening harvest and famine and distress follow. He imparts to the air a deadly taint. And thousands perish by the pestilence. These visitations are to become more and more frequent and disastrous. Destruction will be upon both man and beast. The earth mourneth and fadeth away. The haughty people do languish. The earth also is defiled under the inhabitants thereof because they have transgressed the laws, changed the ordinance, broken the everlasting covenant. Isaiah 24, 4 and 5. That's from the Great Controversy, page 500. And 89. And so I believe that we are right here. Matthew chapter 24 and verse 8. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Satan is working to do what he does, and there's a reason he's doing it. I, we, we, I, won't, I won't get to get into that today, but he really wants the world to panic. He wants everyone in fear. Luke 21, 25 and 26 says, and there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars, and upon the earth, the stress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth. For the powers of heaven are shaken. Men's hearts will fail them. Number one killer in America is heart disease. Anxiety is, is an incredible problem. We've legalizing marijuana all over the country, and one of the major reasons people say they need it for their anxiety and their stress. One of the eight laws of health that we have as Adventists is trust in God. And because man does not trust in God, as man has removed, as man has removed God from society, and as we're going to talk about, scoff and mock um, God, the second coming of our Lord, and Christians themselves, as man does that. The consequences of God's spirit being removed from the earth will be seen. How will they be seen? Well, let's look at it. CDC data, drug overdose deaths top 100,000 for the first time in a 12-month period. And this is U.S. News and World Report. They showed that America has had over 100,000 people die from drug overdoses. Since the pandemic began almost two years ago, we say over 700,000 have died from coronavirus. Nobody's talking about the fact that 100,000 Americans in 12 months have died from drug overdoses. This is prophecy being fulfilled. Men's hearts failing them for fear. God made the human heart so big, only he can fill it. So as people try and fill the God-sized hole in their heart with alcohol and drugs and marijuana and illicit sexual behavior and all the other things they try, Netflix and the rest of it, None of that will fill the God-sized hole in your heart. So what happens? People keep taking more and more and more. And here in America, we are seeing deaths at rates we have never seen. Some other little interesting, some other, some other interesting prophetic facts uh, are, 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 are verses, Daniel 12 and verse 4. But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book, even to the end of time, to the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. And we know when William Miller began to preach about uh, Advent, and so many people say William Miller was a Seventh-day Adventist, he was not, but he, he preached an Advent message of Christ's soon return in 1844. Um, and what happened? Because of that, people began to read the book of Daniel, study it diligently. That's why the book was sealed until the time of the end. And in the rest of the series, I talk about when the time of the end began. But it was sealed until that time. Then the book of Daniel opened up and people began to understand the 490 year prophecy, the 2300 day prophecy. When anyone, the 490 um, uh, day prophecy, 70 weeks, when anyone tells you that these prophecies are not important, be careful what they say after that. Understanding these prophecies anchor you in truth. You are not going to withstand persecution for truth you do not understand. You're not going to stay there and be tortured when you don't even know what you believe. It says that many shall run to and fro and knowledge shall be increased. And there's some who say, listen, this is an increase in biblical knowledge. And it is absolutely true that that has happened. But there's also the increase in knowledge. Have you thought about artificial intelligence, self-driving cars, things that were, were just science fiction just 15 years ago are now reality. 
The world is about to change drastically because of these technologies. And I believe the Lord is soon to return, so we won't even see where and far these technologies go. In some ways, technology is like the Tower of Babel. It is how man is looking to live forever. There's one thing that they talked about, how they could transfer a person's brain to this um, computer base and the person could live on. And I mean, there's some, there's some stuff that they're trying to do. But it just tells you time is short. The scoffers, the last days, scoffers and religious skeptics. Second Peter 3 and verse 3, knowing this first that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lust, and that these scoffers will say, where is, the, where is the promise of his return? Since our fathers fell asleep, you know, he's not come back. They're going to mock and laugh at the fact that we still hold on to a, a, the, the, the second coming as a hope. Second Timothy 4, 3 and 4 says this, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and shall turn away their ears from the truth, and they shall be turned unto fables. Ha! So they're going to mock the fact that Jesus is soon to return. I'm going to show you some modern examples of that. And they're going to turn away their ears from the truth and be turned unto fables. What kind of fables? Like evolution. Here is Pope, Pope John Paul II. And this is an article, I think this is from the New York Times. It says, ignoring, uh, ignoring conflicts with biblical texts, John Paul calls view more than a hypothesis. And so the, the Roman Catholic Church made believing basically in the first two chapters of Genesis no longer necessary. It, it's more evolution is what really happened, not what the Bible says. This was the beloved Pope John Paul II who did this. Well, if you can't trust God in the first two chapters of the Bible, how do you trust him in a chapter like John chapter 3 and verse 16 where it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. If we can't believe God created the world, how can we believe that God can redeem us or recreate the world well you won't the whole worldview switches if god didn't create the world if we're all just the product of an accident this is the cunningly this is a cunningly devised fable and of course the scoffers this is a comic book called the second coming this is the first um one you see what is supposed to be jesus here feeding f holding someone at gunpoint um someone with a gun giving them bread and you see the other one uh the superman character who's supposed to be like the modern day jesus you see the solar um crest on his chest remember sun worship so this is this represents sun worship this would theoretically represent biblical worship but at the end of the day it is a combined to mock and scoff and laugh at christians um uh, and there's, there's a show on tv here in the states called black jesus that is where Jesus smokes marijuana and does all these things in Compton, California. Very terrible. Uh, this, 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 I never read the novel, but here's the novel, The Second Coming, where they take Jesus and turn him into a cigarette-smoking criminal. Um, and this is from 2011. You have men like this, like Bill Maher, who's a pretty famous comedian and TV host here in America, and he says things like this. And he has a documentary called Religious, where he basically says all religion is relig ridiculous. These are the scoffers. With, with huge influence. And here's what he says. Religion, it's just the ultimate hustle. Why can't God just defeat the devil? It's the same reason a comic book character can't defeat, defeat his nemesis. Then there's no story. If God gets rid of the devil, and he could, be, and he could because he's all powerful, well, there's no fear, no reason to come to church. Scoffers. Now, of course, Bill Maher probably doesn't understand the great controversy. He doesn't understand that the reason the devil is allowed to live is because um, all of God's creatures are given free choice and the devil chose to rebel against God. If God just wiped the devil out, no one would see that the devil's um, argument is false or that the consequences of sin lead to destruction. So yes, God is going to destroy the devil. But he's going to destroy this, the devil after he has redeemed a people out of this earth and after the entire universe has seen that God's character is vindicated because that is what the devil has attacked. It's not about just wiping out the devil so everyone can live the way they want. God is looking to create a world where sin never rises again. But the scoffers, 
With arguments like this, many people who once were Christians turn from God, not understanding truth. There will also be rampant immorality in the last days, the scripture says. We're talking prophecy now. 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5, this know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded. Look at this. I like this one. Lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. In fact, there are preachers who preach more about how you can get the pleasures of this world than how you get to know God and have his character. There are preachers who are preaching to you that you can have a Bentley and you should have a mansion and that if you don't have money, it's because you don't believe God and it's because you don't have faith. And of course, if you give him money, you're going to get money. Paul tells Timothy that in the last days, there will people who will be lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. Verse 5, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. What power would give you true godliness? That's the power of the Holy Spirit. If you, you can have a form of godliness with all the activism and the wokeism and everything that's going on in the world right now, people can come across as morally sound as they save the oceans and as they uh, protest racism and as they protest political injustices and social injustices. And, and, and it's not that these things are bad things, but you, you can look like you're a saint because you're fighting the good fight of a cause on earth, similar to Barabbas, who the Jews chose over Christ, who was a rebel rouser and a revolutionary and an activist. They chose him because he was going to fix their situation now. But guess what? We don't want that kind of godliness that is tied to temporary earthly situations. We want the type of godliness that comes from the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, the transforming of our characters to be more like Jesus. That's the goal in this whole thing. We're saved so that we can develop his character. We get to live <laughs> under the auspices of the Holy Ghost and the tutelage of the scripture so that we can develop the character of Christ. That's why the hymn says, turn your eyes upon Jesus and look full in his wonderful face and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. If not, as you have a form of godliness and you turn away from the power of the Holy Ghost to actually transform character, if you do that and you push away the Holy Spirit, but you act like you're holy anyway, immorality comes up. You become lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. Here's Jay-Z, greatest rapper of all time. Do what thou wilt. And that comes from um, a, a kind of dark satanic statement. Do as thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. You can study more into that. Of course, it pushes all of the pornography and all of the sexual things. This is a book on how North American men travel to Southeast Asia, countries like Thailand and other places and, and, and Philippines and, and, and pick up underage girls to, to, to mess with. That, um, and of course, the sex trafficking that happens in the world. What, what, what is the cause of all of this? As the spirit of God is removed, as people reject the moral law of the scripture, all of these things seem perfectly fine to do. Of course, we're seeing record-breaking cases of sexually transmitted diseases in the United States. I won't get too into this. This is up to 2019. It keeps climbing. In fact, in one thing I read, it was even more prevalent in rural America, where you wouldn't think it would happen. And in older Americans, like over 60, I had some of the highest increase rates. Um, so this is, shows you that there's a breakdown of the kind of biblical morality that most Christians would ascribe to. This is, in a sense, the fulfillment of prophecy. Matthew 24 and verse 14 says it like this, and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. When the world has had a chance collectively to choose whether they're going to serve God or they're going to serve the enemy, whether they're going to receive the seal of God or the mark of the beast, when that time comes, 
That's when the, 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 the judgment will finish in the most holy place and Christ will take off, step out of the temple, take off his priestly robe and put on his kingly garb and mount the white horse according to Revelation and return with all the hosts of heaven to come and get us. So guess what? The devil doesn't want you evangelizing. He doesn't want you preaching the truth. And isn't it interesting? Uh, the current Pope recently said, Pope says Christians should never seek to convert unbelievers. Anyone who proselytizes is not a disciple of Jesus. And there's a whole article, you can look this up and look up the, where he said this at a, at a, a high school in, in Italy. Um, so should we not try and evangelize the world to Christ? Well, if we don't, according to Matthew chapter 24, verse 14, it is, a, it is a requirement for the second coming that we proselytize, that we share the good news of the gospel, that we save souls from death. Matthew 24 and verse 13 says it like this, but he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. This is not a cross country race church. I mean, this is not a sprint. It is a cross country race. You gotta go long distances. That means when you fall, that's why the scripture says, a just man falls seven times, rises every time. I don't care if you've fallen in sin. I don't care about the mistakes you've made. I don't care the life you had. You have not out sinned God's ability to save you. Get up, dust yourself off and keep moving towards Christ. Because Jesus says in Revelation 16 and verse 15, Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. He's coming as a thief, not because he's coming to steal anything, but because a lot of people like a thief comes when people are not prepared. A lot of folk are not going to be prepared for when Jesus comes. Matthew 25 and verse 13, watch therefore. For you know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man comes. The prophecies have given you the road signs. But the exact day and hour we do not know. And when you see these signs, Jesus says, be of, be of good cheer. It is I. Be not afraid. Look up for your redemption draws nigh. We ought to rejoice as we see these signs being fulfilled in the world. Some you listen to some Adventists right now with this coronavirus stuff, they're panicking, they're afraid. The government's gonna get us. But guess what? That's what the Bible prophesies. Persecution will come. All who will live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Matthew chapter 24, we don't get deep into it in this talk, but it, basically the whole world turns on the believers. Then shall they persecute you and say all manner of evil against you, the scripture says. It even says that, our enemies will be they of our own household. The world is going to turn against us. That's coming. That's prophecy. You can see it happening already. And yet there are Christians who are so afraid they're going to stop it from happening. It's got to happen. The question is, can you praise God in the storm? If you're afraid of the time of trouble, it's not the time of trouble you're really afraid of. And that's not really your issue. You see, if Jesus is in the vessel, you can smile at the storm. Focus on knowing Jesus. If you're in a relationship with Christ, you don't have to worry about what's coming on the world in a fearful way. Here's what uh, Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 6. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. 1 Peter 4, 7. The end of all things is at hand. Be therefore sober and watch unto prayer. This is why the devil wants you drunk on alcohol and high on weed and drugs, because he does not want you sober. He does not want you watching. He does not want you watching unto prayer. You gotta have a strong prayer life in these last days. He doesn't want you to have that. Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. Christ wants to put a new garment on you. He wants to cover your sin. And I can tell you as I'm here in the States, seeing all the pandemonium, the division of the nation, the war of words, it is, it is, it is unpleasant to behold. But we've got to understand as Christians that our hope is not in governments, it's not in wealth, not in politicians, not in technology. 
Our trust is in the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus said to the disciples, not one stone here will be left upon another because Jesus was moving out of the temple and he's going to build a church on earth. And I want to invite you to be a part of that church. I want to invite you to, uh, to accept the calling that Christ is making to you, to come to him and be his child. Ah, if that's what you want, I want you to just pray with me now. Father God, we thank you for this opportunity to study your word. And I ask in a special way, Lord, that those who have not chosen you, who are hearing this message, would choose Jesus Christ as their savior. Lord, send the Holy Spirit. And Lord, help us all to watch and be sober. Lord, we need the character of Christ. So Lord, let us turn our eyes upon him, for by beholding we will become changed. This is our prayer in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen.